Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. For technical assistance, please phone Redback Support on 1-800-733-416 or to listen to the webinar through your phone instead, the dial-in number and passcode is listed in the chat box. Today's topic is Group Memory Rehabilitation Post-Stroke. We are pleased to welcome our presenters for today, Dana Wong, Sandy Grayson and Jennifer Bradshaw. This webinar is live and interactive. You are encouraged to post questions to our presenters by typing into the chat box in the bottom left-hand corner, located to the right of the cogwheel. Your questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. I'd now like to hand you over to Dana. Hi everyone and welcome to our webinar on group-based memory rehabilitation post-stroke. Um, so I'm Dana Wong uh, and I'm from the School of Psychological Sciences and the Monash Psychology Centre at Monash University. And my co-presenters today are Jen Bradshaw from Austin Health and Sandy Grayson from Monash Health, um, who are both senior clinical neuropsychologists. So the way it's going to run today is that um, uh, I'm going to start off by talking about the potential benefits of group-based memory rehabilitation um, and some of the evidence about that so far. Uh, I'll then go on to talk about the Monash Memory Skills Group, which I've been running uh, for the last couple of years. I'll talk about what that contains and how it's structured and some of our outcomes so far. Then I'm going to be handing over to Jen, who's going to be talking about the rollout of the Memory Skills Group at Austin Health. And then following that, Sandy will talk about the rollout at Monash Health. And then at the end, we'll have some time for questions. So why memory rehabilitation? Um, so what we know is that uh, memory difficulties are very common post-stroke and they affect up to half of our uh, stroke patients. And these difficulties do have a really significant impact on their ability to work and their independence in activity of daily living and their quality of life. Um, we also know from a study from a couple of years ago from the Stroke Foundation that access to cognitive rehabilitation remains one of the greatest areas of unmet need for survivors of stroke in Australia. And a similar study from a couple of years before that um, in the UK said that um, uh, from a team of health professionals and stroke survivors who identified 226 unique unanswered research questions with regard to life after stroke, um, that the top question was what are the best ways to improve cognition after stroke. So this is clearly an area of great need in stroke rehabilitation. So in terms of um, why we might choose to run a memory skills group, well, we know that um, research evidence supports the effectiveness of internal and external compensatory memory strategies, uh, as well as lifestyle improvements in things like sleep and exercise. I'll go into a little bit of that evidence in a moment. Um, we also know that strategy use needs to be taught and individually tailored in order to be effectively implemented and maintained. So giving somebody you know, a two-page handout with a list of memory strategies on it uh, and sending them away with that, um, will have probably limited effectiveness compared to actually individually going through those strategies with them and showing them how to apply them in their everyday lives. Uh, the other thing is that groups have the unique ingredient of sharing the experience with other people who have similar issues. And from running these groups, I think that's quite a powerful element of it. So um, I'm not going to do a, a hugely comprehensive review of the evidence of uh, group-based memory rehabilitation, but I did want to highlight these two Australian studies that found significant improvements in both objective and subjective memory, as well as strategy use in both neurological patients broadly and also more spe specifically in a stroke sample after participation in a memory skills group. So that's encouraging evidence from an Australian context. Um, also wanted to highlight these guidelines, which uh, were developed in the context of traumatic brain injury, um, but the principles are very similar because there's a fair degree of overlap between the memory rehabilitation needs of the traumatic brain injury population and those of stroke. So these guidelines were written by a group of world leaders in cognitive rehabilitation, um, and these guidelines here relate to memory. What they concluded is that um, the, there's good evidence for the integration of internal and external compensatory memory strategies that are implemented using instructional procedures for rehabilitation for memory impairments. And the evidence for the efficacy of restorative strategies um, currently remains weak. So what they mean by restorative strategies is repetitive drills such as computerized cognitive training programs like Lumosity, for example. So um, this is consistent with what I was saying before about um, the efficacy of compensatory memory strategies. Um, so there's no exactly equivalent uh, guidelines in the area of stroke, 
but um, it's very encouraging to see that in the draft clinical guidelines for stroke management for 2017, released by the Stroke Foundation um, consultation, I think that uh, ends today in fact, that there are some consensus-based recommendations in the area of memory, um, which say that any patient with memory impairment causing difficulties in rehabilitation or adaptive functioning should have their nursing and therapy sessions tailored to use techniques which capitalise on preserved memory abilities, be assessed to see if compensatory techniques such as notebooks, diaries, audio tapes, electronic organisers and audio alarms are useful, have therapy delivered in an environment as similar to the stroke survivor's usual environment as possible to encourage generalisation and be taught approaches aimed at directly improving their memory. Um, they list a few there including things like unique using a notebook, a mobile phone and audio alerts, electronic calendars and reminders. So these to me seem quite sensible recommendations, um, but they are just at the level of consensus-based recommendations at the moment. So we do need more research to lift those up to the level of strong evidence-based recommendations. So I'll turn now to the Monash Memory Skills Group and describe to you a little bit about that. So what it is is a six-week group program where participants attend one two-hour session per week for six weeks. And that's held at the Monash Psychology Centre, which is our uh, student training clinic uh, for psychology students uh, at Monash University. And the group program is for people who've had an acquired brain injury. So that includes stroke, but also other forms of acquired brain injury as well, including traumatic brain injury, encephalitis, telepoxic brain injury, and so on. Um, and participants have experienced memory problems in their everyday life, and they'd like to learn strategies to help them manage their memory problems more effectively. So, um, sorry, I have a problem with the slide there. Um, so, uh, the group is facilitated by myself along with a two Doctor of Psychology students on clinical placement with me. And the participants are from the community and they pay $150 to attend the program unless they're um, part of a clinical trial. So we do have a clinical trial running at the moment um, comparing the Monash Memory Skills group with a weightless control group as well as a computerised cognitive training task. So um, in terms of the, uh, the group, they first attend a pre-group assessment before they come along to the group and then after the group they also attend an, another very similar assessment. Um, and that I think is a very important um, element of the group. So those assessments include uh, measures of both objective and subjective memory function um, and strategy use and goal attainment as well. So these assessments are done regardless of whether or not the participants are research participants. Um, and I think they're important for a number of reasons. Uh, they help us understand each participant's strengths and weaknesses and goals um, and that can help build the participant's awareness of the issues um, that they're coming in with and it's an, an, a way for us to assess the, their appropriateness for the group, uh, to discuss their expectations about the group. It helps us monitor the effectiveness of the intervention by comparing their results post-group uh, to pre-group and also it allows us to give them some feedback about how they've uh, uh, progressed as a result of uh, coming to the group. So um, after they've done the post-group assessment, we look at their results and we send them a report that describes how they've gone and what improvements they've made, which I think is uh, valuable. And it's also an opportunity for them to provide us with feedback about how they found the group and what they found useful and not so useful. So the Monash Memory Skills Group is based on a manualised program called Making the Most of Your Memory and that's available online to order through ASPE resources. Um, so this is the manualised program that was used in the two Australian studies that I mentioned before. So it's been shown to result in significant improvements in both objective and subjective memory. Um, we have made a number of changes to the program, including reducing the amount of content in it and increasing the time devoted to the group discussion. And also we've made the content a little bit more focused on everyday functional tasks. So in this manual they go through different strategies um, as the focus, whereas our focus is more on the task. So for example, finding your way to a new place or um, remembering somebody's name. So um, I'll go through a little bit now what the main components of the program are. So each session has three main components, um, psychoeducation, strategies and lifestyle issues. So in terms of psychoeducation, we go through uh, things like the stages of memory, so encoding, storage and retrieval. We talk about the important brain regions for memory and a little bit about how things like stroke will affect memory. 
there's the strategies component is probably the main uh, aspect of the group content and we cover both internal strategies so that's mental strategies that people use to uh, improve their encoding and learning and also external memory strategies uh, so that's using things in the environment to help prompt you so I'm going to go through some of those strategies in a bit more detail now to give you a bit of a flavor of what we discuss in the group so in the first session we go through a name learning exercise um, which uh, it includes the strategies of association and repetition. So, um, so what that involves is uh, you say your name and then um, something that you like starting with the same letter. So for example, my name's Dana and I like dancing. And then the next person in the group would say their name and the thing that they like starting with the same letter. Um, so let's say the next person is Jen and she says, my name's Jen and I like jelly beans. And then she would also need to uh, introduce me and say what I like. So she would need to say, and this is Dana, and she likes dancing. And then if the next person in the group was Sandy, she might say, my name's Sandy, and I like sleeping. And this is Jen, and she likes jelly beans. And that's Dana, and she likes dancing. So it's a great way to learn each other's names. And what we often find with that exercise is that um, people remember more names than they expect to. And um, they really notice the impact of using an association on their memory for the name. So that's a nice illustration of an association strategy. We also noticed that the people at the beginning of the group whose names are said more often are also often better remembered. So highlighting the impact of repetition of the information on memory. So it's a nice little exercise to, to start off the first session. Um, other strategies that we talk about in the group include things for remembering instructions and information you're told verbally. We talk about different strategies for note taking. Um, we talk about learning and remembering a route. Uh, so we talk about you know, noticing landmarks. And we also actually go for a walk. And um, the participants are asked to notice what they see around them and remember the route that they've taken. We talk about remembering to do something in the future, so prospective memory, um, including strategies like diaries, notes, alarms, and so on. Um, we also talk about remembering past events. So um, we use things like contextual cues and photos to help prompt past memories. And uh, we also spend a fair chunk of time talking about using electronic devices and things like smartphone apps, um, which is often new information for, for our stroke survivors. Um, and we also have some content on keeping track of conversations and, and finding words, and also remembering the steps of uh, complex tasks. And those two um, pieces of content were not part of the original manual, that were added in response to um, participants often requesting that content. Um, then in terms of lifestyle issues, so that's another really important aspect of the group, that um, and a, a different lifestyle issue was covered every week. Um, in the first week, we talk about optimizing the home and office environment, um, so decluttering, making it nice and quiet and organized to enable information to be encoded effectively, um, improve attention. Uh, then we talk about exercise and its impact on memory and brain function generally. And um, we give them a, a homework task to uh, in increase their amount of exercise during the week. We have a, a section on nutrition where we talk about different foods that are healthy for the brain. Um, so of course fruit and veg and things like fish as well. And um, they have to eat fish or something with uh, some omega-3s in it during the week. Um, and then uh, we have some content on mood and stress and how stress affects memory. And we talk about the different ways to reduce stress and that's also a homework task for them where they identify something that will reduce their stress during the week. And then um, in the fifth session we talk about sleep and fatigue and how they, those things impact memory. And that's often a, a, of great interest to our participants because um, the fatigue seems to be co-occurring with memory difficulties quite often. Um, so there's a lot of interest in that content. We talk about both sleep hygiene and sleep routines and also fatigue management strategies. So you can see um, that there's quite a range of content that we do cover in the group, in the group and you know, it's not really only memory that we talk about. Um, we talk a lot about sort of brain health more generally um, and lots of questions come in uh, from people, not just about memory but about other things to do with their stroke recovery. Um, so they seem to be interested in a lot of different things, not just memory. Um, so this is a couple of photos uh, from different groups. 
Um, so you can see hopefully in the middle of the screen in, in both of those photos um, there is a, a computer screen there that we use to present um, some slides and um, those slides are also printed out for them so they can take them away with them. Um, and, uh, but there's also a, a lot of time for group discussion which I think is a really important element of the group as all the participants learn from each other and, and like hearing about other people's experiences and strategies. Um, each session also includes some practice of the strategies discussed. So we don't just talk about them, we actually do them. Um, and we see how people are kind of implementing and using the strategies that we, that we talk about and try and tailor that uh, so it's uh, working for them in the best possible way. And each session some homework is set to to enable them to practice using the strategies between sessions. Um, and that's also a really important method for enhancing the generalisation and maintenance of the strategies as well. So for each session the two Doctor of Psychology students and I are there all facilitating different aspects of the session. So we do have more than one facilitator which helps when there's um, particular uh, group members with um, special needs or um, we, it's helpful sometimes to just have two eyes on the matter. Um, so uh, these are a couple of photos of um, the whiteboard in the group room um, and this is uh, some notes from the first session of the first group where participants are uh, asked to brainstorm ideas about external memory strategies, so using things in their environment to help them remember and that I guess gives you a flavour of the sorts of strategies that we discussed in the group. Uh, one other thing to highlight is that um, in the fourth week of the group we invite family members and, and friends or carers to a session um, that occurs at the same time as the, the group uh, participants are in their session. Um, and what we do in that session is, uh, so one of the group facilitators will be in with the family members and the other two students will be with the, um, the other group members. And with the family members we review the contents of the group and talk about um, those elements that I was describing before, so the psychoeducation, the different strategies that have been discussed and the lifestyle factors that impact memory. Um, so that's a chance for the family members to uh, get an overview of what's discussed in the group um, as sometimes the group members won't always communicate that fully. And um, it's also an opportunity for them to discuss the issues that uh, arise commonly in caring for somebody with memory problems and to talk about that amongst themselves and, and share some, you know, some thoughts and ideas and perspectives about that. So I think that's a, also a valuable element. Um, I wanted to highlight that you know, in, in addition to presenting the content in the group um, there's always process issues to consider as well in, in ensuring the group runs smoothly and is as beneficial as possible for all the group participants. And so um, it's really part of the role of the facilitators to be actively trying to support the group to be a cohesive um, functional unit and um, that involves you know, uh, being I guess, I guess an expert guide I would see the role of the facilitator as being. Um, and trying to contain and guide group discussion so that it's as, as relevant as possible and um, also tailoring content to group members with different needs. So I think um, you know, it's important to facilitate trust amongst the members by firstly providing clear rules on confidentiality and so forth in the first session and also leaving the space to contribute quite open and not pressuring anyone to do or say anything um, against their will of course and you know being just respectful and even handed and modelling openness and honesty in the way uh, you communicate as facilitators and also encouraging a reflective attitude where you're also very much recognising when things are working well and when group members are using helpful strategies. Uh, I think it's important to create a space for people who um, may not necessarily volunteer much themselves, they might be quite reticent and you can um, use strategies like directing eye contact or direct questions their way when, when they're ready. Um, there's also the issue of uh, participants who can be quite verbose and tangential and I found there's at least one in each of the groups that I've run. Um, and so there it's a responsibility for um, containing and, and guiding that discussion so that um, people are, you know, whatever anyone says is, is respected but um, that it's contained where possible to uh, stop it to going into undesirable or inappropriate or irrelevant directions. Um, and also the facilitators are there to reflect on the progress of the group and, and give some insights into what the group's experiencing. So in terms of tailoring the content to group members with different needs, um, 
I think that's one of the, what, you know, while there's a lot of advantages of, of groups, um, one of the disadvantages is that there's a limited opportunity to really individually tailor the content to each participant who's there. Um, so I guess what I do in response to that is to um, describe the strategies as, I guess, a menu of different options that uh, could be used in, in, um, uh, for each person and that so we, it's understandable if some of the strategies are not that appropriate for each individual and it's, we encourage them to choose the strategies that are most helpful for them. So turning a little bit to the outcomes of the group so far. Um, so uh, I found that there has been a strong demand for the service and I've received a fairly constant stream of referrals from people all across Melbourne and a lot of the referrers have, um, have commented that this is a uh, they're very grateful that this service now exists and that, that before they felt that there wasn't anything equivalent to be able to refer people to. So for example, after a neuropsychological assessment, if um, memory difficulties were identified, um, there may not have been many options. Um, so that's been quite validating to hear that kind of feedback. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do now is show you uh, some of the preliminary results from the group so far bearing in mind that um, our numbers are relatively low in, in um, the context of these kind of clinical trials and, um, and the fact that what I'm showing you at the moment um, is data without a control group. So um, just bearing all those caveats in mind. Um, these are results also, I should say, are from our, our full sample of uh, participants from the memory skills group, um, only about half of which had a stroke. So this is um, firstly the um, change in performance on the Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test, which is a wordless learning task tapping into verbal memory. And you can see there that there's an improvement in performance um, after the group. This didn't quite reach statistical significance, but um, showed a promising trend. There was also a similar uh, trend on the Ray figure, which is a visual memory task. This time this difference was statistically uh, significant and showed that, um, that participants' recall of a complex geometric figure improved uh, after the group. So we also do a prospective memory task called the Royal Prince Alfred Prospective Memory Test. Um, and that's an um, objective test of prospective memory where the total score includes points for remembering to do something after a short period, so a few minutes, and also a long period, such as a week. And um, so they have to remember to do things in response to both time-based cues, so um, say in the 15 minutes time, and also event-based cues, so for example, when this alarm goes off. So uh, you can see that their performance on this task has significantly improved, um, and that was really great to see, and not too surprising because there's a fair focus on prospective memory strategies in the group. Um, we also give the everyday memory questionnaire, and so um, the score on this uh, means, so lower scores mean less frequent everyday memory problems. So the decline on this after the group was a good thing and showed that um, participants uh, report significantly um, fewer everyday memory failures after the group. Uh, so that was good to see. Um, we had a number of other measures that we also gave uh, on subjective memory and we found that uh, participants re reported significantly increased understanding of their memory and an improved kind of global overall self-evaluation of their memory as well. This um, is uh, looking at strategy use, so in, in terms of both internal and external strategies, and we found a significant increase in their use of strategies after the group. So that was um, also encouraging to see. Uh, we have looked at a couple of other outcome measures which I, I don't have time to report, but I did want to note that we also have a randomised control trial currently running that compares the memory group with the computerised cognitive training um, program, which I mentioned before, as well as a waitlist control. And um, the preliminary analyses of the results of that trial are looking promising also in terms of um, goal attainment. So um, uh, participants who have uh, participated in the memory skills group are showing improvement in their uh, goals. So they, they're achieving the goals that they've set for themselves, which is fantastic. So while of course we need to collect more data to confirm these findings, it seems that overall participants are showing some improvements after the group on a range of measures, which is encouraging. I also wanted to highlight some of the comments that have been made by participants in the group, um, because I think these reflect their experiences quite nicely. So um, these are some typical comments. So things are 
so this is uh, what they say when we ask for their feedback at the post group assessment. So the most helpful thing about the group is the support that I'm getting and the hints and tips from other people in the group. It helps me identify what is wrong with my memory and strategies to improve it. Now I feel like I can keep being independent and I don't have to move to a retirement village. I like the fact that it's friendly and informal. I'm learning more about my mind and what I can do with it than I ever imagined. Thank you, providing, thank you for providing such a great service. Thanks so much for a really supportive and helpful environment. We now have a lot to build on. Some sort of program like this should be available to stroke people in rehabilitation. This last comment was a very common theme in our participants with stroke and it's one of the major reasons why we applied for funding from the Victorian Stroke Clinical Network uh, Subacute Initiative to roll out the group in the two major stroke services at Austin Health and Monash Health um, to try and increase access to this kind of service. So before I hand over to Jen um, to describe um, that rollout at Austin Health, I just want to briefly highlight a, a case study of a gentleman called Barry. Barry has given his consent for me to uh, talk about his case today. Um, Barry is a 66 year old man who's got a master's level education and very high functioning in his um, previous occupational history. So he was a consultant in transport regulation for a number of years. Barry had a left sided um, a middle cerebral artery infarction after surgery for atrial fibrillation three and a half years before he came to the group. And he spent some time in the Austin Hospital and then went on to the Royal Talbot for two months of rehabilitation and also uh, had six months of rehab at the Peter James Centre. So Barry experienced difficulties with his speech and his mobility uh, as well as memory and fatigue. And at the pre-group assessment he, uh, he identified goals um, to improve his memory for what he's uh, been reading and also the conversations that he's been having. So Barry, Barry was a, um, a randomised controlled trial participant I should say. So um, Barry was a, a fantastic member of the group. He um, very much uh, contributed especially towards the second half of the group um, to giving a lot of ideas to other group participants, um, some of whom commented in their, their post group assessments that they found it really useful to have him in the group because he had a fair bit of knowledge about stroke and had already researched a fair bit of um, information about different strategies and so forth. So it was, um, really highlighting the, the impact of that peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, and at the post-group assessment he demonstrated significant improvement um, on goal attainment scaling so he had achieved those goals and his performance on working memory measures had also improved so that was great to see. Um, at the uh, post-group assessment Barry provided some really interesting qualitative feedback about the group. He noted that he hadn't had any other cognitive rehab during the last um, three and a half years and I just want to read out um, what he did tell us. So he said, the course has been really good for me for a wide variety of reasons. First, the obvious memory features. Names, recollections, lists, use of IT, uh, so phones and tablets. But also the other aspects have probably been even more important. Knowledge of stroke, being able to bounce things off the experts and discussing things in a group of like-minded people. The course is said to be about memory but it covers much of the cognitive dimension. This has not been avail made available to me in my stroke rehabilitation. I've had terrific access to some very good physiotherapists and speech pathologists and some contact with occupational therapists but no one made any attempt to help me make sense of my scrambled mind. Some sort of program like this should be available to stroke people in rehabilitation. And Barry's um, taken that and run with it because he's now our consumer representative for um, the project. Uh, funded by the Victorian Stroke Clinical Network Subacute Initiative where we're rolling out that group to two major public health services and so um, it's great to see that he's used his experience to try and be able to share that with, with more stroke survivors. So on that note I'm going to hand over now to Jen Bradshaw who's going to talk about the rollout of the Memory Skills Group at Austin Health. Thanks Donna. Dana's really clearly identified in her presentation there the increasing demand and need for this type of memory rehabilitation service and at Austin Health we're really excited to um, be involved in, in that rollout. Um, so we were involved in um, liaising with Dana and her team to look at expanding that service and meet the needs of stroke clients with memory issues over in the northeast suburbs where Austin is based. So just to give a little bit of context as to um, stroke care at Austin Health, 
Austin Health is an acute uh, medical service um, and it's been operating a stroke unit here for the best part of the last 40 years. It was actually the first Australian stroke unit um, available in, Aust in Australia, um, opening in 1977. Um, it was a dedicated stroke unit that really um, provided that rapid access to a multidisciplinary team that provided uh, specialist expertise in diagnosis, in treatment and management of acute stroke. And the need for those stroke units um, was really proven um, through indicators that show that Access and treatment in an acute stroke unit is one of the best predictors of stroke outcome next to acute stroke therapy. So it you know, really highlighted the need for that sort of service in, in Australia. Currently in terms of um, uh, pathways of care, if patients actually identify memory issues after a stroke, there are four main pathways at Austin Health. Uh, we have neuropsychologists based on the acute inpatient unit and that's where I work principally um, and we see stroke patients within seven days and that's the typical turnover rate for um, <clears throat> patients presenting to our unit. Um, it's a very early and acute setting um, but certainly um, it's not uncommon for patients to um, present with concerns about their memory in that setting. Patients they then be forwarded on to see us through our outpatient clinic and that may be at the four to six week mark after they've seen their medical specialist and again it's at that point that they might be noted that memory is a concern and they're referred for neuropsychology at that point. Um, memory issues may also be identified um, in their inpatient rehabilitation stay. So some of our inpatients are referred directly into inpatient rehab units. Um, and the one that the Austin is most closely affiliated with is the Royal Talbot Rehabilitation Centre. Uh, the other option for um, access to um, services for patients with memory concerns is through the home and community based rehab service um, overseen by the Health Independence Program and, and that really is um, referrals into things like the Rehab in the Home Program where OTs and neuropsychs um, are able to perform some sort of you know, individual cognitive therapy um, in the community. So you can see that access to any sort of memory or cognitive rehabilitation is limited to that which can be provided either by the neuropsychologist or the OTs attached to either the inpatient or the outpatient units. Um, that they're really providing individual one-to-one -one therapy which is great but it's, it's time intensive and it's not always cost effective. So that you are only really capturing a small proportion of um, the potential need of these, these people um, and that there also can be significant delays in accessing those services because um, there's limited supply of neuropsychologists and OTs to, to provide that memory support for stroke survivors. Notably in the, the time since the stroke unit has been operating in Austin Health there hasn't been any dedicated group memory rehab service within the Austin catchment at all and that's been a real um, glaring uh, area of need. So I thought to really highlight the, the reason why um, a rollout to other health services is, is necessary I'd um, go through a case study of a, a man that I saw oh, two, three years ago now. So he's a 65 year old gentleman um, working full time at the time of his stroke, high functioning gentleman working in a corporate communication role which um, had a big media component. He was responsible for media releases, media liaison um, within his corporate corporation. Um, he was a previously highly independent gentleman, had a master's degree. And he suffered a left posterior cerebral artery territory stroke. Um, now the topography of a PCA stroke is relevant from a memory perspective in that um, the region affected involves the medial aspect of the, the left temporal lobe um, and often um, also the left occipital lobe. Um, but with involvement of the temporal lobe um, you're getting involvement of critical memory structures as well as um, the supply that the PCA you know, supplies to the thalamus, another important memory structure. So they're critical regions that support verbal memory function um, and certainly people with this type of stroke are vulnerable um, in terms of having residual memory deficits. So in terms of this fellow's um, course of recovery, he 
um, was on the ward. He recovered quite well from his stroke. And I guess in terms of recovered well, that's often looked at from the point of view of motor recovery and communication. So he didn't have any residual motor deficits, which is not unexpected given the posterior nature of his stroke. He was communicating very normally. The only real neurological deficit that was um, noted was that he had a residual um, impairment in his visual field in his right upper quadrant. But that wasn't impacting significantly on his day-to-day -day function on the ward and the only concern raised was that that would impact him on driving and he was restricted from driving for the mandatory um, period post-discharge and he was ultimately discharged home. And I think for this gentleman it's a good example of how the cognitive or memory deficits that can arise after a stroke are often hidden at that acute stage. Um, in the acute hospital environment, it's an incredibly structured and very routine setting where there aren't a lot of cognitive or memory-based demands. So that environment can often mask potential memory problems, particularly in a high-functioning or, or younger stroke patient uh, presenting on the unit. So this fellow didn't actually present to us until a good six months after his stroke. Um, he had been battling on at work for the best part of that six months. He'd gone back to work after a month off um, and had really been trying to just get back to his normal life. But it was increasingly apparent to him that in that more cognitively demanding work environment, he was encountering significant frustration. In particular, he was noticing significant memory difficulties. He would attend meetings and have struggled, really struggled to recall following the meeting the details that had been discussed, particularly if there wasn't any you know, notes or written information that he could refer back to. He would struggle to remember forthcoming events like meetings that were coming up or releases that he had to get done. He would forget details of recent conversations with colleagues and would be embarrassed when they would ask him why he hadn't attended to a particular task and not have any you know, recollection of that conversation or the detail of that conversation. And he also found that in reading written documents he wasn't able to retain the content of what he'd been reading. For him who had been you know, incredibly officious and high functioning, it was really notable how it was impacting on his productivity at work and his efficiency which for him was embarrassing and it, it wasn't to his personal expectation or the expectation of his colleagues. And as a result he was really quite low in mood and was really spiralling into you know, a possible depressive um, disorder. And that's not uncommon um, that if these problems aren't attended to early, um, complications of mood and anxiety post-stroke are often encountered. So examining this fellow, he really um, was a high functioning man against a, a backdrop of otherwise completely normal cognitive function. The one notable finding was an isolated and quite severe impairment of verbal memory function. And it was really quite evident from his um, subjective account and, and complaints that this ongoing memory deficit as a result of his stroke six months down the track was still having a significant impact and notably on his work performance and it was really contributing to his lowered mood. Um, the nature of this deficit was entirely consistent with the laterality of his stroke. It had been a new onset problem and, and clearly directly related to that. So knowing that the Monash Memory Skills Group existed, that was certainly something that I presented to him as an option because um, he really um, didn't have access to any of the acute hospital services anymore being so far down the track um, and he hadn't had any early input from the point of view of any memory rehabilitation. So, um, Historically we've not had that available here at the Austin. Um, it's really much more of a diagnostic assessment unit um, and then we refer on to inpatient or outpatient rehabilitation services. But even at those services there's no group memory based rehabilitation um, support services offered. And this client was inc incredibly keen to pursue some sort of memory skills training to try and improve his day to day memory function. The problems that we encountered though were that um, while he was certainly keen and motivated and, and well able to participate in such a group, the Monash Memory Skills Group is located more than 30 kilometres away from the Austin 
and this fellow, as with many of our stroke patients, still had restrictions on his driving um, due to his residual fear defect. Um, he was still awaiting a formal OT driving assessment to see whether or not he could regain his licence. So while he wanted to attend, he physically um, and practically wasn't able to do so. The other complication was that the amount of time that it would take to travel via public transport or depend on family members to take him was complicated by the fact that he was still wanting to work full time and taking time away from work for that amount of time was more than just you know, attending a short two hour group session, it was really for him taking a full day off work. Um, and he, didn't feel that he wanted to do that. Um, and as a result, it again, sort of encountered that barrier and that frustration, um, further contributing to his feelings of depression and, and just not being able to, to get on with his life because of these memory problems. So I guess it's cases like these that really highlighted the need for um, an Austin-based uh, memory skills group um, of the nature that Dan has been running through the Monash Psychology Centre. We really saw the benefits of such a group as being that it is local to the, the client's area. It's easy for them to access um, and it doesn't depend on them having to um, have their licence back post-stroke. Um, continuity of care is also really important that we can have the clinicians who are involved with them in the acute medical setting following on with them through this group in the outpatient setting and I think that just gives patients a sense of continuity which is so important in care these days. Um, and the other thing is that we can offer a much more timely access to a service such as this that um, with an on-site service it's much easier and quicker to get patients linked into a service uh, to support their memory. Understandably though, the process is required to implement such a service, these things all sound like a great idea but then you actually get to the point of trying to implement something like that and, and it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, certainly with clinical workload demands of an acute medical setting, um, we really realised quite quickly that it wasn't something we could easily absorb into our daily clinical workloads which really um, highlighted the need for us to access some sort of funding um, that would allow us to roll out such a group um, but also still um, offer the acute services that we do here at Austin. And that's where um, I guess the application um, as a multi-centre study for the um, Victorian Stroke Clinical Network grant um, arose. Um, while we were waiting on the outcome of that um, funding application, we um, approached Dana and she was kind enough to allow us access to facilitated training at the Monash Psychology Centre where we were able to observe the group and, and really um, get up to speed in, in what it would take to be a facilitator to run a group like that. Um, and then through that process look at how we could adapt those materials to make them generic and suitable for use at the Austin Hospital. Um, we were um, really happy and you know, we're very grateful for the generosity of the VCSN um, in the grant that they provided us and that's really allowed us the opportunity now to, to move forward and, and find facilities and develop materials and access IT requirements and also employ a clinical facilitator to actually run the group here at Austin. So um, things really are moving in the right direction now. So on that note, I'd really just like to flag that we do have our first um, stroke memory skills group up and running here at Austin. It's due to begin on the 7th of February and we're actively recruiting for that now. Um, we've certainly had a really good response so far, um, just in the two or three weeks since we've had final ethics approval and we've been advertising. Um, but for any listeners there who have stroke clients who are in the Austin Health catchment and have been affiliated with Austin Health in some way, who have had a stroke and, and have ongoing memory concerns, we'd love to hear from you and, and I guess just to be aware in the future that we hope this will be an ongoing service that we can run here at the Austin. Thank you. Thanks Jen and thanks Dana. Um, so I'm Sandy Grayson and I'm from Monash Health. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the Monash Health arm of the project. I'll apologise in advance for my slightly scratchy voice. Uh, it's only just returning after a few days of having disappeared, so hopefully uh, it doesn't cause too many problems. So Monash Health uh, provides stroke care across the continuum with services provided at three acute sites, three subacute sites as well as in community rehabilitation. 
in community rehabilitation at our service, we have both home and centre-based services and we deliver these from six sites within our catchment. Within community rehab, we have an interdisciplinary team approach and there is a team based at each site with the disciplines as outlined there on the slides. Our framework for rehabilitation is goal-focused, client-centred care, uh, which is pretty common, I think, across many rehab services. We've also got neurological uh, specialists to rehabilitation streams uh, in our services. Uh, and on average, about 50% of the clients within this stream are stroke survivors. Just to give you an idea of, of the type of, um, or the scope of our service, last year we provided 557 episodes of care and 12,709 occasions of service for stroke survivors in community rehabilitation. So just to give you a snapshot of what our current cognitive rehabilitation services uh, include, we have a cognitive screening procedure for all stroke clients and then clients with a positive cognitive screen are referred to occupational therapy and or neuropsychology. Clients who also have behavioural or emotional changes and uh, or subjective cognitive change would also be referred for further investigation. We then deliver individual cognitive rehabilitation, which is tailored to client-centred goals. So our current service does actually provide cognitive rehabilitation for stroke clients. And I guess that leads to the question of why use a memory group. I think uh, Dana and Jen have already outlined some of these issues, that there is an increasing demand for cognitive rehabilitation, um, in fact, for all health services, including cognitive rehabilitation. But unfortunately, as we all know, our resources remain limited and that's unlikely to change any time soon. Uh, we also believe that group programs may be a more efficient way to deliver some services, especially in those areas where there are many commonalities and in interventions across clients. Um, and this would include memory and fatigue is another one. We've also observed that there are additional benefits to clients from group programs and Dana's touched on some of these already. These include sharing experiences with other clients uh, and normalising the difficulties that they're encountering, social support and sharing strategies that have been validated by people in similar situations. To highlight the potential added benefits of group programs in our services, I'd like to present a case study. This is of a 55-year-old man who was fully independent and running his own business prior to his stroke. He had a subarachnoid hemorrhage following a ruptured right posterior cerebral artery aneurysm and also had left cerebellar and multiple right posterior cerebral artery infarcts. He ended up with a uh, left hemianopia, but as with Jen's case, had intact mobility, but had subjective deficits in multitasking, spatial awareness, visuospatial abilities, memory and fatigue. Neuropsychological assessment confirmed mild deficits in speed, verbal learning and memory recall, and moderate impairment in spatial learning. Fatigue and depressed mood were also present. So this client received real rehabilitation throughout his recovery. So in subacute services in patient rehab, he received rehabilitation in the home and then centre-based community rehabilitation. He also received uh, services through the ABI Mobility Services through Guide Dogs Victoria. There was no lack of access to services for this um, client. Within community rehab, his goals were around activity and participation, uh, so closing down his business, accessing the community and completing his outdoor chores. The rehabilitation itself focused on, uh, or the goals, focused on strategies for fatigue and memory in both work and everyday activities, as well as spatial navigation. So he then received individual cognitive rehabilitation to address multitasking, memory, navigation and fatigue, and he also completed our fatigue management group. He made good progress on all of his goals. Despite that good progress, however, he reported ongoing functional memory difficulties. He also remained socially isolated and had depressed mood. Now this client became a research volunteer and completed the Monash Memory Skills Group around a year after discharge from community rehabilitation. The results that are shown here are the client's self-reported outcomes and these included increasing his use of external memory strategies, 
in particular using the electronic diary and apps on his phone, which he had not wanted to explore previously. I think in his own words describes it best. He said, the most recent major turning point in my recovery was the memory group. Now on a daily basis, I use some of the strategies we discussed. I abbreviate a list regularly. I use my mobile phone constantly for memory aids. I remember people's names by adding a description. Feel comfortable saying I forgot your name and have improved my social skills. I regularly talk to people I don't know and I'm comfortable with it. He also made lifestyle changes, especially in improved sleep, and commented on the positive social interaction and support in the group. After completing the group, he successfully applied for a new job and has now returned to work three years after his stroke. Here's a snapshot of this client's outcomes following the memory group. So on the left hand side is a graph of his self-reported strategy use uh, pre and post group, so internal strategies and external strategies. And you can see there's been an increase in strategy use uh, post group compared with pre group. And the graph on the right shows his everyday memory failures as rated by his partner and there's been a decrease in those following the group. This case really highlights the potential for additional positive outcomes over and above individual cognitive rehab. And this is a key part of our rationale for implementing a memory group program within our services. Now Jen's already covered uh, some steps involved in implementation and these are similar across both health services. So I'm going to talk a little bit on the facilitated training aspect of the memory skills group. So the training for the memory group has involved observation of the group run at Monash University and this has been done in two different ways, either on site, as Jen mentioned before, or video observation. Now I've completed the video observation method and have found this a convenient and flexible way to complete the training. There is a lot to master in delivering the group and I think Dan has covered that earlier in talking about the facilitation process as well as the content. Um, and being able to revise and review the sessions as needed has been helpful. I've run, as I mentioned, the fatigue management group through our services and I've personally found that to be a significant benefit. So having some past experience in group facilitation has made being able to observe and, and be aware of the group processes um, much easier. A thorough knowledge of the session content and the background information is also an essential part of the training. This is needed to be able to confidently deliver the sessions and to answer the wide variety of questions from clients during the group. As Jen mentioned, the group structure, content and materials are included in the training. However, some minor adaptations of content and service delivery have been required to fit each local context. Uh, it's, it's been uh, essential to take the time to review and adapt these to get the best fit within our service and we'll continue to, to make further adaptions as we roll out the memory skills group. So we're looking forward to delivering the two groups at each site next year, um, both starting in February and plan to share the results via another webinar when the project is completed. Okay, so um, we now have some time for questions and there have been some questions um, floating in. Um, so thank you for all your questions. So um, there have been a couple of questions about the, uh, the availability or resourcing of running such a group in rural and regional areas, which is a great question. Um, currently I'm not aware that there are any groups similar running in, in regional areas. However, what I can say is that um, currently leading a, a study which involves delivering the memory skills intervention individually via telehealth. So that's uh, a video conferencing version of the memory skills group. So if you, uh, have, if you work in one of those areas and you have stroke patients who you think would benefit from this intervention, then please do um, shoot me an email um, or give me a call using the contact details which are, um, I've displayed on that final slide there um, and I'd be really happy to talk about involving them in the study. That means free access to, to the service. Um, in terms of running a memory group in that region, um, we don't have plans for that currently, but we are you know, looking at different grant applications and things and it may well be something um, to uh, look for in the future. So if you are interested in that, um, again, get in contact and be happy to discuss that with you. Um, so there are also a couple of questions about how to refer to the Austin uh, group and whether you accept um, referrals uh, for clients that have not been previously engaged with Austin Health 
and um, you know, is there a specific referral form and is there a flyer and what are the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So I'll let Jen answer that about the referral process for the Austin group. Thanks Dana. So the um, best email address probably is just to contact me via the email address on your screen there. Um, we would have the clinic, clinical facilitator obviously contact you to discuss the particular patients you have in mind. As far as the ethics approval that we have for the existing um, two groups that we're going to be running early in the new year, at this stage they are for the um, patients who have been affiliated with Austin Health in the past, so um, have either been an inpatient or an outpatient of the service. Certainly down the track it's something that we hope to expand but I guess as far as the, um, the, the grant funding and the ethics application that we have at the moment it's really limited to patients who are affiliated with Austin Health. Um, but as Dana mentioned on one of her earlier slides, um, it's really quite a broad inclusion criteria, um, notably that they've had a stroke, um, that they've got sufficient English language skills to participate and uh, no other major neurological comorbidity that would limit their participation in the group, um, but they're adult, um, not paediatric cases. So unless I've missed anything there Dana, I think they're the, the, the key criteria that we'd be looking for um, as well as them being a, a former or current Austin Health patient. That sounds right to me. Um, yeah. Anything else to add to that Jen? I don't think so. Um, so we've also had um, some questions about sharing of resources um, for others who want to run similar groups and also some more detailed questions about references for the everyday memory questionnaire and so forth. Um, for references for the um, outcome measures, um, again feel free to email me and I can um, send those to you. Um, in terms of resources, as I mentioned, the, the manual that the Monash Memory Skills Group is based on um, is available for purchase from the ASPE resources website. So that is certainly a starting point. I do think um, that it, it would be, uh, it, it's helpful to have kind of some training about group facilitation. If you haven't run a group before or a memory skills intervention before, um, then probably just reading the manual is not sufficient. So um, again, if you're interested in running a group and would like some input about that, uh, um, feel free to contact me and, and we can um, talk about that. That's no problem. Um, there was another question about involving other allied health disciplines in the running of the group, such as speech and OT. Um, another great question. Um, I'm aware that there's a, a group uh, that's um, been running and is going to continue to run at Epworth Rehabilitation where they have had um, other allied health disciplines contributing, particularly speech. Um, and, and also the nutrition or the dietitians there have um, contributed to the nutrition component. So um, I think there's certainly scope for that. Uh, I think um, there is an advantage to having a neuropsychologist um, or somebody who has experience in um, memory assessment and rehabilitation um, running the group because there's, and also the lifestyle factors are another thing that um, you need to be, have a fair bit of knowledge and skill with working with um, for example, mood and stress issues. So, because um, those things do arise in the group. So, I think um, while it's great to have multiple allied health disciplines involved, um, the, the main facilitator, I think, does need to have particular expertise in uh, understanding memory and its rehabilitation, as well as um, cognitive and, and mood rehabilitation more broadly. Um, so, somebody missed where you can purchase the manual from. That's, it. that's on the slides and that's um, the uh, ASPE, Australasian Society for the Study of Brain Impairment. So, it's assbi.com.au. Um, there's a resources section there. Um, and somebody else has also asked, can we get a copy of these slides? Um, this uh, webinar, the recording of it, um, will be available to watch again um, on the Inform Me website, which is, I believe, informme.org.au. Um, I think you need to register, uh, for, but that's easy to do uh, on that website and you'll be able to access uh, the webinar from there. So if you've missed anything, um, that would be a good way to re-access the content. Um, just seeing if there's any other questions which I have missed. Oh, um, there was one about the Monash CRC assessment. Do you want to answer that, Sandy? Yeah, thanks for that question. So we do the mocker as the screen for all of our stroke clients and then depending on if, if the screen is positive then they would be referred on for further assessment. But it's the mocker that we use as the cognitive screen in the first instance for all of our 
community rehab stroke clients. I think just coming back to that question about involving other disciplines, we certainly have done that. So I mentioned our fatigue management group before, which is a joint um, effort between occupational therapy and neuropsychology within our service. And certainly our OT is interested in, in being involved in the group, um, provided we can demonstrate that it's economically uh, sustainable and feasible within our service. So that's certainly in the long term plan, but short term is to demonstrate that it is economically and clinically feasible and then hopefully we can use that information to uh, help others roll it out. Okay, so I believe we've reached the end of our hour. So I just want to say a huge thank you for, to everyone who's participated and asked some great questions. There may have been a couple of questions that we didn't quite get to, but um, feel free, as I said before, to email either me or, or Jen or Sandy about any of those and if you've got any uh, referrals for us or questions about running a group yourself, I'm very happy to answer those. So thanks everyone. Thank you.